of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A friend from Jamaica told this joke at the diocesan convention. They were two Jamaican men. They had an argument. The argument was whether there is any such thing as a ghost. Some of you believe in ghosts, some of you don't, right? So they had an argument, and the one who believed in ghosts said, you know what? Let me go to the cemetery and check it out. So the two men went at midnight to the cemetery. You can imagine this over at Greenwood Union, right? They got there at midnight. It's a moonlit night. Everything was very still and peaceful and quiet. So the man who doesn't believe in ghosts said, see there, there are no ghosts. Let's go home. Then they started to hear this So they went and they looked. And there in the moonlight, crouched before a capstone with a chisel and a hammer, they saw a little old man. And he was tapping away on the stone. So the man who didn't believe in ghosts drew himself up to his full height and said, just what is it that you think you're doing? And the old man got up and he said, well, don't you see? They've misspelled my name. <laughs> When you're dead and gone, will they misspell your name? Will anybody know who you really were when you're dead and gone? All the lessons today point us to the end of our time. Whether it's the parable of the talents where the master comes in and asks for a rendering of all the accounts his servants had either invested or not invested their talent, which means money, actually, in that context, but it's a nice pun for us, isn't it? They're, they're gifts. But also in Thessalonians, Paul's saying, I don't want you to be worried about what comes in the end time, and the psalmist saying, Teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. What will you do in these days that you have, starting right now, that makes it clear who you really are and whose you really are? Are you children of light? Or are you children of darkness? Actions will show that. David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, has said that character is a permanent commitment to tasks that cannot be completed in your lifetime. It might be a permanent commitment to a project that you may never see. For example, the building in which you sit and I stand right now is the fourth building built by Christ Church since we formed as a community over 300 years ago in 1695. We started to worship together in 1702, but we didn't have a building. A rector named George Muirson got the building project going, it took them 19 years. When they first got the building up, they only had four walls and a roof. They had no floor. They had no pulpit. They had no steeple. They had no bell. The average life expectancy of the group that built this church was 36 years old. 36. Muirson himself died at the age of 33, long before the building was finished. They lent their effort, their leadership, and yes, some of their money to the building that started this community on its way in a fairly permanent sense. 
That's that other thing that Brooks said when I heard him, that part of our role, if we have character, and I would say as Christians, is that we take delivery of the gifts of the dead. That's his phrase. It's lovely, isn't it? We take delivery of the gifts of the dead and pass that on with some improvement to the next generation. But it means that we are constantly looking out, not just for ourselves, not just for the people around us, but for the people who will be here after us, in this place, after we're gone. After we're gone. Who are you? Whose are you? And how will people know what you stood for when you're gone? My husband, Ken, and I traveled to Africa this summer to the country of Mozambique. Our son, who's 26, is a Peace Corps volunteer in a tiny village on the coast of the Indian Ocean. His project, along with some Brazilian missionaries, is to provide nutritional support and training for families where there is AIDS. Young mothers, very young children, who need more to eat and who need better to eat. But one thing they all have there is peanuts. So Edmund and his partners there are teaching the mothers to make peanut butter. And every week they bring in the mothers and their children. This feeding program is, say, six months to three years, so you can imagine. Younger than the nursery school and then just a little bit older. So the mothers and the kids come and they sit in this open air classroom. There's a roof and a floor and no walls. A little bit like us in 1702, <laughs> right? The women sit in chairs or in a circle around and some of them sit on the floor and some of the children are on the floor. And of course, while the adults are talking, the children are sort of wandering around. Some of these children are already sick. So they all look younger than they actually are. One little girl that looked like she couldn't be more than 18 months old, but it was closer to three, was sitting with her mother on the floor in the center of the room. And she was clearly pretty sick. Her nose was running, she was whimpering, and she was trying to eat her little peanut butter roll and drink the sweet tea that she had a cup in front of her. While some of the other children who were really doing a little better had a little weight on them, we're doing the things that two-year-olds do, wandering around and pulling on their mothers and playing with their cups. But this tiny girl, whose name was Masia, took a piece of her roll and took it to one of the stronger children and gave it to him to eat. She was weak, she was ill, he was doing better, she gave him her food. Now, the first time she did it, her mother had sort of pushed her. The second time she did it, she did it without any prompting at all. And then she did it a third time with another child. And I thought, I can't get over it. She needs the food more than they do. Why is she giving it away? Why is she giving it? Is it possible that you and I have it in our DNA, that who we really are meant to be is the sort of people who do what Masia did, which is that we give. That it's in our very nature, and that something isn't quite right unless we're giving. It's like my dog, Frank. Not as endearing as that little girl. <laughs> We have a giant dog. He's 110, 115 pounds. He's a Mastiff Lab mix. Imagine a black lab who drools a lot. That's Frank. He's really big, but he's half retriever. We got him a little toy a couple of weeks ago. It's a soft blue bone. It's a stuffed bone. It looks like a baby toy, right? Well, every day when we go on another walk, he runs and gets that soft blue bone and picks it up in his mouth, and he has it in his mouth for the whole walk. People stop and comment, because it looks a little bit like a baby with a pacifier. 
you know. He's got this big blue bone, but he wants to carry it. Why does he want to carry it? He wants to carry it because he's a retriever. He's bred to fetch and carry. If we were hunting, which we don't do, he would run to get the duck and bring it back in his mouth and carry it until we needed him to set it down. He is more relaxed and more truly himself when he's carrying something in his mouth. It's what he's built for. Are you and I built for giving? And how can we experience that when we have so much? When so much of the time when we give something, it's extra. One of the women in Mozambique gave me a used blouse that she had that I'm sure came from some American in the United States. It was so soft, it looked like it had been worn by 20 people. Right? What do you give when you make that bag for the Salvation Army? You take the things out of your closet you haven't worn in three years. You so don't need it. In fact, it helps you to get rid of it because it makes more room in your closet for what you're about to buy. Am I right? To give in the way that that little girl gave, to give in the way that we feel it in our bones, to give in the way that begins to feed our souls, we have to feel it. We have to give something that we do care about. We have to give something that we might miss. The biblical standard is 10%. Comes from the Hebrew scripture. It was meant to be the first fruits. The harvest came in, and the first 10% of what you thought you would have went to the synagogue. The first 10%, not the last 10%. Now, if you've ever tried to reduce your spending by 10%, you know that that's just about right. You can go down 5% and not really feel it. 10%? I think at whatever point of income you are, at 10%, you're going to feel it. Now, this is easy math to do, right? You take the last digit off your number, and you got 10%. If it's $16,000, you take off that last zero, you get to 1,600, right? So this is very, the easiest fraction there is. That's called tithing. That's called a tithing. Can you give 10%? I don't say to Christ Church, could your giving, I don't know, to Ebola relief, to your college, to, to things that help, to things that change lives, could your giving for the sake of others and for the sake of the future, could you get that to 10%? Have you ever looked at the number? Have you toted it up if you're taking it off in your taxes and compared it? Now, you know, right away we flinch. We go, oh, does she mean net or gross, right? 10% of what? You decide. You decide which number on that tax return you want to compare it to. Can you give 10%? If the number's really low, look again and challenge yourself Let's say you're at 1%. Can you get to 2? That's actually the hardest step. Mathematically, that's the hardest one you ever do, is 1% to 2%. It's the only time you have to, ever have to double it. From there on, the increments get smaller, right? As you get closer and closer to that 10% number, it actually, it actually gets better. If that 10% makes you uncomfortable, compare it to another number. Compare it to what you're saving for retirement. Compare it to how much you're paying for, you fill in the blank, <laughs> some luxury item. Hold it up against something else and ask yourself, which one do I feel? And which one of these numbers makes a sense of dignity start to surge up? Which one of these numbers makes me straighten my shoulders and go, I'm starting to feel like I'm doing my part. I'm starting to feel like I'm doing my part. 
Now that's different from looking at the church budget and saying they need X, I'll give Y. That's not a bad way to look at it. That is prudent, that's responsible, that's good judgment, that's management. We need it. I'm just challenging you as your pastor to say if it's your spiritual life you want to nourish here, proportionate giving will put you much further down the road. Proportionate. Remember that the guy with the five talents made the ten. The guy with the two talents got the four. Only the one who buried it in the ground got into any trouble at all with his master and lord. Only the one who acted out of fear and buried what he had got in trouble at the end of the day. About the others, the master of the house was ecstatic. Can you imagine hearing from God himself? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. If they get your name right at the end of the day, will it say giver? Yes. 